In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, Leaf Chalene and I, we are going to share our thoughts on the big, huge matchup on Monday night for the national championship. Although it's Purdue versus UConn, everybody is interested in Zach Eady versus Donovan Klingon. Stay tuned to hear our thoughts on the two big giants that have dominated college basketball, or at least dominated the NCAA tournament in two different ways. Stay tuned. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board. And my co-host for today is Leif Tuling, the guy that watches more college basketball than anyone else. We are down to the very last game of the 23-24 college basketball season. But before we get into this episode, I want to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, which is the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. So go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA and use code locked on NBA. It must be an all lowercase for a first deposit match up to $100. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe, like, share, comment. Make sure you click the bell so you can be notified every time we post because we are your source for NBA draft content five days per week. And NBA draft season is warming up. A lot of the players are checking into their pre-draft locations or have moved in this weekend. And a lot of guys are going to start their pre-draft process this week. So it's that time. But before we get into the draft, let's, let's talk about this last game, which is... For me, I didn't do a bracket this year, but this is the matchup that I was starting to look forward to because I I didn't pay attention to the brackets. But once I realized maybe around the Sweet 16 that this was a potential matchup, this is what I've been looking forward to. You got Zach Eady, who is, in my opinion, the most dominant force, offensive force in college basketball against Donovan Klingon, who is the most dominant defensive presence in college basketball. And they happen to play the same position. They're meeting up for the national championship. So I think this is going to be a very, very exciting matchup coming up. But I want to hear Leaf's opinion on this matchup. First of all, which team do you think comes out on top? I think UConn wins by 20. By 20. (laughs) Like 15 to 20. Uh, Without getting too into the weeds because it's a draft show, basically I think UConn's guards are so much ahead of uh, Purdue's guards like Braden Smith had a really good year for Purdue. Uh, I think Castle, uh, you're going to see Diara come off the bench. You're going to see Newton. You're going to see Spencer Hound Smith, who's the only ball handler for Purdue. He played all 40 minutes, had a terrible game against NC State. Well, UConn's guards are 15 times better. And that doesn't even begin to start with Klingon's the best answer for Edie in the country. The only way Purdue wins this is if Edie gets Klingon into foul trouble. And then Edie has a monstrous game against Samson Johnson. But I just don't think the guards will be able to get the ball into Edie very easily. And, and I don't think Purdue's good on defense. Don't get me wrong. I just don't think you're going to be able to play the big boy personnel against the way UConn spreads you out one through four. Obviously, Klingon's the five. Um, so I, I think that UConn wins by 15 to 20. Uh, I'm rooting for Purdue, though. All right. You, you had mentioned something that I had mentioned before. I think I mentioned it in an article. I'm not sure if it was on the podcast or it was on an article. I think that UConn is going to win, but I do think that Zach Eady is going to get Donovan Klingon in foul trouble. I think it is absolutely impossible to defend Zach Eady as a big and not pick up fouls. Or if you're not picking up fouls, then you may be trying not to avoid fouls and you're not playing as aggressive as you want to play. And sometimes you just pick up fouls on Edie without him getting the ball. It can be on the offensive rebound. He's just such a massive presence on the offensive end. I see somehow see Edie winning this individual matchup just because I can't see I, I can't see a situation where Klingon doesn't enter halftime with at least two to three fouls because they're they're gonna feed him the ball and he's just impossible to stop down on the, under the basket. Yeah, I, I think where Klingon, and I'm sure we'll get to this as some of the pluses for Klingon because he's probably made the biggest name for himself. Obviously, Castle has a claim with his final four games, scoring 21 is career high. But 
the thing that Klingon's done so well is he mucks up every pick and roll by being a deep drop coverage, and he's got impeccable timing. He gets yeah. up and blocks shots. Well, Purdue doesn't run a pick and roll the same way as most teams. They don't roll Edie. They kind of they kind of send him to a block afterwards. He's not catching this on the move. He they set the pick. Braden Smith comes off wide, and they set Edie up on the block. And now, if you if you tag the roll man, which is this is technical basketball, but if you tag the roll man, that means the help side guy is helping. And that means that they, they'll they probably pass the ball to one side and the entry will come from the wing or the corner into Edie. Whereas Klingon typically is, is really good at dropping and playing two. He plays both the big guy and deters the lob or the bounce pass being thrown to the big and the driver, typically a guard, from shooting a floater or a layup and he blocks it quite frequently. Well, Edie's going to stake out position on the block. He's bigger and stronger than Klingon. Klingon's not used to that. So I think that you're right, that, that Edie will win the matchups in terms of when he gets on the block, but Edie was pushed out by Jake Middlebrooks. Um, and, and it was interesting as NC state, he was being pushed out. And when he put the ball on the floor, there's a bit of teach tape of Edie seven foot four. When he puts the ball on the floor, even if you're not doubling, people can dig and it makes it harder for Edie. And I think UConn's guards are going to be opportunistic in that regard. Uh, I think Donovan Klingon has made himself a really desirable NBA big because the NBA Bigs either prioritize uh, just teams. They prioritize bigs that protect the rim, and then they can cover corners. And now, if you have a guy like Klingon who protects the rim, you don't have to uh, you don't have to guard and help as much. You can you can play out on the perimeter, take away threes, and make teams bend their shot chart to shooting jump shots. I think Klingon's made it really apparent that he's a ba- he's got the ability to do that at the next level because he's dominating at the collegiate level against pick and roll teams. Yeah, he's absolutely putting a, a bottle on the rim, making it a no-fly zone. Even though the Alabama game was, I say the score was closer than the final score. They kind of put uh, UConn made a run at the end. I thought Alabama played them well, but there were so many times where guys went to the basket and they thought twice about putting it up. It turned into a drive. It turned into a kickout. I mean, he killed so many, so many opportunities they had at the rim. And then you talk about Edie against NC State. And I, I watched the game, and there were times where he had some turnovers. There was a, a, um, a time where you felt like NC State had a good game plan against him. And he ended up finishing with five turnovers, which is going to be tough to have five turnovers against UConn and still win that game. But he still finished 9 of 14 from the floor with 12 boards, four assists and 20 points and two blocks. So even when he had a game where you felt like there was a decent game plan against him, he still ended up dominating that game. And Purdue only had two other guys score in in double figures. I think their shooters are going to need to be absolutely on fire to to beat to beat UConn. I want to hear your thoughts on Klingon's offensive game. Do you think he has enough offensive game to make Edie play defense? Because I feel like Edie hasn't really been tested a lot on offense. I thought DJ Burns was maybe the closest, but do you think Klingon has enough offense to kind of maybe even get Edie in foul trouble? Because I figure if you get Edie in foul trouble, Purdue is, is cooked. Well, Edie, Edie doesn't really foul. Like that that's just kind of his MO defensively. Like he he'll just put his arms up and he knows when to concede baskets because his presence is worth more than the two points he's giving up. Uh though I will say Klingon Klingon's impressed me offensively against teams because he's known when to get the ball and he's been decisive when he's gotten it. Uh, he's he's come off pinned down, I'm mean, not pinned down, back screens, and he's caught the ball or flex screens, and he's got the ball on the block. He's taken one dribble, gone straight up. He's made good passes. Uh, so I, initially, we we talked about Klingon in one episode, and I talked about how his lift wasn't there, and we were worried about his foot injuries. Well, he's jumping well defensively, showcasing block shots, but I think. The fact that he's becoming a vertical lob threat again, where he's you yeah. have to really respect his dives to the rim and his athleticism has really opened up the game because now teams sag to him and it, it gives more space to the guards. And then when the guards get there, they pitch it off to Kling and he's re- been the recipient of dunks. So I don't think he's a guy that you want the ball in the hands of. He's not a hub of your offense, but he's an intelligent decision maker. He can catch a short roll should, they, should you ask him to do so and make a smart move. But really what it'll be is, can he finish putbacks? Can he catch some dunks? Make ED guard two, and and actually have to think, wow, this guy might be able to jump high enough to dunk. When usually I can just kind of back up and influence the play. So I, I don't think he'll challenge ED in the sense of foul trouble. 
may, I think the more more of that stuff will happen on rebounds than it will be defensive for Edie. When, if Edie's going to pick up fouls, it'll be trying to get extra possessions and fighting for position versus fouling Klingon on the block. I agree. All right. When we return, I want to talk a little bit more about Donovan Klingon's impact on the defensive end and also Zach Edie's dominance. But let's talk about Prize Picks because Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app. They now have over 3 million members, and it is the easiest and the most exciting way to get in on the action. All you have to do is just pick more or less than two or more player stats, and you can watch the winnings roll in. Now, March is over. It is now April. The biggest game in college basketball is today so you can be part of the action for the men's and also the nba because of the nba you have the playoffs or the play-in the play-in round begins april 16th 17th and 19th and the playoffs begin april 20th and you can win up to 100 times your money with prize picks as you know the best players take the game to a new level in the postseason and you can win up to 100 times your money all you have to do is have as little as four correct picks you can turn 10 bucks into a thousand. You can also do it with hockey and also for this NCAA championship game. So I advise you to go to prizepicks.com. Download the app today. Use the promo code locked on NBA. You have to do it in all lowercase letters. You can get a first deposit match up to $100. So once again, prizepicks.com. Download the app. Use the promo code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It is that easy with prize picks. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day long? And do you have to turn down the volume because all they're doing is shouting and going back and forth with each other? Well, you can make the switch to Locked On Sports today, which is a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all of the yelling and screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news. And it's also streaming 24 hours a day, seven days a week on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day all right second segment and so far we've just spent the whole first segment talking about zach Eady and donovan Klingon. Eady is in my opinion the most dominant offensive force in college basketball donovan Klingon is the most dominant defensive presence in college basketball and they are going to clash in the national championship game so i wanted to talk a little bit about Klingon's dominance on defense. We've seen him turn the corner in a sense. It's crazy to say turn the corner. He was a dominant defender in very short spurts last year. This year at the beginning of the season, got off to a slow start. I mean, he was still a dominant defender, but he was missing that pop and explosiveness as he dealt with some lower leg injuries. And then or I say maybe like the past month, month and a half, he's gotten better and better. It seems like he's getting better every single game. So I have a question for you. I've looked at the numbers and Klingon has only played 30 minutes three times in his entire career at UConn. He came close against Alabama. He played 29 minutes. I think the 30, the three 30 minute games were against Indiana, Kansas, and then I want to say Marquette in, in the Big East championship game. Now, on the other hand, Edie is a guy that people talk about his conditioning. I know you've mentioned, does he have the conditioning to play or keep up with the pace of the NBA? And Edie's played, he played 40 minutes the last game. He's had games where he's played all but 33 seconds. If this matchup goes down to the wire, are you concerned at all about Klingon's effectiveness to play Zach Edie for possibly 40 minutes in a game? Well, I, I mean, the fact that he hasn't done it doesn't inspire too much faith, but I do think part of the reason he hasn't played that many is UConn's usually blasting teams. Yep. And when Samson Johnson plays, it's a bit of like a curveball to Klingon's fastball. He's he's someone who hedges screens as opposed to playing drop coverage. Uh, for those of you listening, hedging a screen is is jumping out high and picking up the guard high, whereas Klingon drops back and protects the rim. 
So def- uh, opposing teams really have to uh, see the game differently when the, the two sides are. And I think that's intentional tactician stuff from Hurley. Uh, so I, I'm a little less worried. I really think the way he's been moving, the, w- the way he's been commanding the pain in these games uh, inspires faith more so than I am concerned by the fact that he hasn't played them enough minutes. The wear and tear of playing Edie and, and avoiding foul trouble, I think, is going to be the limiting factor on minutes more so than his conditioning. Uh, I was I was scrolling through some numbers for for Klingon before we got on here. He he just impacts the game defensively, uh, and and it's more than numbers can really dictate. But at at the rim, people people shoot layups worse when he's there than than the average. They they, they the shot chart just bends in a way that you typically haven't seen. Like Walker Kessler kind of was more of like a trail from behind and block shots guy at Auburn. Well, Klingon, what he does is he gets back. And he he guards two at the same time and then influences your shot, even if he stays with the big. And so while against Purdue, I don't think that's as big of a factor for the reasons I broke down in the first segment. I, I think teams are going to be salivating over the, the the way he does that with ease. And he looks like he's growing as a player offensively because the defensive skill set's ready already. So like I, I've seen a lot of people say, oh, he, if he goes to the Grizzlies, the Grizzlies are going to be a nightmare with John Morant clinging jaron jackson desmond bain like that that's a nightmare and I, I like that fit but i think more and more teams can see what he's doing and convince themselves into saying well that guy like i, I had trepidations about his offensive game or can he play a lot of minutes i i think you see from this tournament the just sheer impact he has over good players against nba athletes and how he reigns supreme in those games uh, i think he's really made himself some money especially the last two games oh yeah yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, that Grizzlies fit. I I did it on one of my mock drafts, and I think that's probably like the best fit for him with with Memphis. I mean, you figure. I mean, him along with Jaron Jackson Jr. That is a pretty intimidating front line, and then I think he could also help out on the boards because Triple J is 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 not the the strongest rebounder. And then I I figure the Grizzlies have a trick up their sleeves when they move Stephen Adams. I've heard rumors that they're going to go after Nick Claxton this summer. But if they can get Klingon, and clearly if you look at the Grizzlies lineups the last few weeks, they are trying to get the highest draft pick possible. All right, I want to talk about Edie. Has your opinion on him changed at all from an NBA draft perspective in the NCAA tournament? Uh, Not really. I think he dominated against single coverage against Tennessee and Adu and Awaka are strong and good defenders, but they, but they didn't help. And he dominated as he should. Uh, I, I think Edie is really good. I think the last two years he's been extremely dominant to the point where he's the last repeat repeat player of the year since Ralph Sampson. And I know I wasn't alive then and, and many listeners won't be, but Ralph Sampson won three player of the years while Michael Jordan was in college. Len Bias was in college. So like those are historical levels of dominance. But I, I just think that the NBA is so space and pace oriented while Donovan Klingon um, has made himself money this week. I think Edie has stayed about the same. I don't think anything that he's done in madness has been surprising. It's just kind of confirmed the belief, okay, this guy can play in the NBA, but his role isn't going to be extremely large, whereas Klingon proved to me that his role can be bigger than maybe like what naysayers may have believed. And I would say I was a little low on Klingon compared to like some. Like He's often in top 10s. I think entering the tournament, I probably had him about 14, and I'll move him up. So, so maybe I was low, and and he's proven to me uh, what what people saw in terms of those flashes. Like we had discussions about him coming out last year just because wow he was dominant, and then he chased Adama Sanogo out. We were like, well, will he will he exceed those expectations? Will he get drafted in the first round after last year? Because that's where he would have gone. Well, he's going to go in the top ten in all odds now. So I think he's made the right move and convinced some naysayers both last year and this year um, as the seasons progressed with his recovery from his foot injury, kind of quenching some of the doubt about, oh, can he still be athletic and impact the game on both ends of the ball? And I think he's only getting better on both ends. Yeah, I uh, I had him in the top 10. I think at one point I had him outside the top 10. That was when he was struggling. And it was more so about I was wondering how the medicals would come back because he had basically, what is it, two foot injuries before like January. So I was wondering if teams would be a little bit hesitant to draft a guy in the top 10 who's listed at 7'2", 280 with two foot injuries. But 
I mean, he's erased those concerns for me. But I want to talk about Edie for me. He's moved up for me. I think that I think that there is a team that that will select him high. I think he's he's an acquired taste, but I, I think that if there's a a general manager, and I'm just gonna say the Thunder are to me are the team that makes a little bit of sense. They have the picks. They have, I mean, their general manager, Sam Presti. I don't know if he's, his official title is general manager. But I know he's their decision maker. He has the job security to where if he can take a gamble on Edie if he likes him high. Like I said, they have plenty of picks. They are a team that could probably use some, some bulk and some strength in the middle. And they can draft a guy like Edie in the top 14 and not expect him to be a 30 minute per game guy. If Zach Eady, in my opinion, goes to a team like the Thunder and he just dominates the game for 12 to 14 minutes per game and gives them another dimension in their second unit, I think they can do that just because they have so many picks and they can gamble. But he's he's impressed me simply because you know every team has tried to come up with a game plan for him whether it's to expose them on defense or throw different looks at them. And it's, it's just, it hasn't worked. So Edie has moved up for me. He was a guy that on my last big board, I think I had him at like number 30, but the way that he's played, I could, I could see him moving up, but he, he's an acquired taste. I mean, there's some teams that probably won't like him. There's some teams that will. I talked to a team last week and they were like, if he's a 31st pick and we're picking that high, we're definitely taking him, but we're a little bit concerned about, whether or not he can be a first round pick, but he also mentioned that there are some teams that he thought would would take a flyer on him pretty high, just as a wild card to kind of muck things up in in different situations. But as far as Klingon, I've actually seen some people say that he could be the first college player selected in the twenty twenty four NBA draft. On one hand, I think that's realistic, but then on the other hand, I'm like he may not even be the first player selected on his own team. So the next segment, I want to hear your thoughts on Stefan Castle. So stay tuned for the next segment. We're going to talk about Stefan Castle. We're going to possibly debate on who is the best prospect on UConn's team that is looking to repeat, to be the first repeat champion since Joakim Noah and Al Horford. But before we get into that, I want to talk to you about LinkedIn, especially if you have a small business, because when you are hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs, because LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and more importantly, for free. And LinkedIn is not just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals which makes it the best place to look for candidates to hire. It gives you access to professionals you cannot find anywhere else. And LinkedIn does all of this while making the process easy and intuitive. And hiring is simple when you have that many quality candidates. It's so easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours from LinkedIn. And LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and may not have the time or the resources to hire. And that's why they they are constantly finding ways to make the process easier. They just launched a feature that helps you write job descriptions, making the process easier and quicker. That is why 2.5 million small businesses are using LinkedIn for hiring. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That is linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, last segment, and I want to talk about Stefan Castle. Castle had a strong performance, career high, if I'm not mistaken, against Alabama, and it was clear, very clear, crystal clear, that at the beginning of the game, Alabama's game plan was to not guard him, leave him open, because shooting, especially threes, is is not his greatest attribute. There's been plenty of times where he's been hesitant to shoot threes, especially open threes. But Alabama's game plan was to leave him open. He knocked down, what, his two first threes in that game. 
And then he just impacted the game in so many ways. Doesn't always put up the biggest numbers because UConn's team is so talented and he doesn't have to score 10 or 15 or 20 to help them win. But with the national championship game or a ticket to the national championship game on the line, Castle had arguably his best performance of the year. He had 21 points, five rebounds, was seven of 13 from the floor. It was two of six from three. Not great. Hit his first two, though. That's what mattered. They, hit they his got, first two. They changed the game. <laughs> kind of loosened up the, the coverages. But the question is with him is if he can make shots, especially from threes, what type of player is he? And I've heard some people say that shooting is the only thing that is preventing him from being the first college player off the board. What are your thoughts on Castle? I wouldn't be surprised if he is the first college player off the board because at the very least, and and I'll I'll get to the overarching thought, but at the very least, you're going to get a a plus athlete, a guy with positional size, someone who has a knack for getting to the rim, shoots free throws at a respectable clip, draws fouls, which is something that is something you like for a guard who attacks. And then the shot, if some the the typical indicator is if you shoot above 75% from the free throw line as a collegiate player, you're going to be a good shooter. So he passes all of those parameters. Um, now, is his shot great? No. I, I, he shoots 28, 27% from three on the regular season. Uh, he made those two, and that changed the game. But defensively, I think the biggest part was he hounded Mark Sears. He was a second-team All-American, fifth-year senior. He's a true freshman. He Mm -hmm. hounded him. He changed the game from that perspective. I think he's going to be an absolute nightmare for Braden Smith in the championship game. Uh, Castle was put in the dunker spot and accepted that humbly after hitting two threes to start the game in a post-up where he he pinned Sears under the basket and he got a high-low feed that you don't see too often from a point guard. And he's like, okay, I'm going to hound them defensively. I'm going to be put in the dunker spot, accept my role. Um, so on one hand, I think, okay, maybe is he kind of similar to Anthony Black from a recent draft class? I don't think that's my direct comparison. I just want to mm-hmm. say from a recent um, draft class where he can impact the game in a lot of ways, but he's lacking in one critical one, which is shooting. Well, I think he's a more functional athlete than Black, whereas Black's more of like a a wiry, quick athlete. Um it, Castle's a little more built and a little more dogged in that sense, but both of them have that that ability to impact the game, play with their hair on fire type. Um, so I, I think that that type of player has value, but the, the thing that the NBA is prioritizing most right now, which has given me pause all year about Stefan Castle, is shooting. So a lot of my my evaluations that I feel like I've missed or or have yet to turn out have been where I've projected, hey, he's a good athlete, therefore I'm sure he can learn to shoot in the NBA because you can't teach athleticism, you can teach shooting. Um, he's been giving me pause in that regard, but I, I every time I watch UConn, I, I say, well, he's making plays that are winning plays on the best team in the country and accepting his role, and that matters to me more than maybe the individual flashes you see from someone who's more of a raw product. Um, so even though I've been very high on Cody Williams, I think that between those two, more and more people are going to sway the way of Stefan Castle because of what he's doing, uh, helping his stock winning with UConn. Question for you, and this just came to me. Can he play a similar role to what Amon Thompson is playing for the Houston Rockets right now? Where it's like that, you don't even know what position he is. I've seen sometimes Amon is like at the five. I think he can. I think his shot is far more encouraging it's than better. Amon Thompson's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, not but the I, same but, level athlete. Yeah, not the <laughs> same level athlete, but I think they can play a similar role. I think there's going to be there's differences, but, but I, I think he's got an ability to play the point guard. Um, like Amon does, not playing all the way with that athleticism, like John Morantish, where he just elevates and soars and people move around and he somehow sees it all. But he's going to be able to slice to the paint, create advantages using his body. And then if the shot comes around, there's going to be more respect given and he can use that that athleticism, that quick twitch part where you're starting to see it again. Another thing that people don't talk about very much when when discussing his productivity is he was dealing with a knee injury for part of this year. And I think that sapped him of some of that first first step, where whereas now he's kind of blowing by people, whereas before it was kind of like bumping his way to the basket, kind of rumbling and using physicality as opposed to just speed and athleticism. And and as I've watched more UConn, especially of late, uh, you see him take Terrence Shannon, who's one of the fastest players in the country, who's five years older and four years older than him, and he physically probably won the matchup. Not o- not only did basketball wise he win the matchup. But physically, he won the matchup. So that really encouraged me in terms of the NBA athleticism. And the shot has signs of encouragement for me. And I, by all accounts, he's really, really tough and 
and like able to take coaching. So I, I do buy his stock and I'm, I'm moving up on he and Klingon, which I, I think most people are, but I think even before this tournament, I was moving up on castle Klingon, I think has moved the needle more for me from this tournament run, even than castle who has gotten all the attention from everyone in the, in like, for instance, I, I, I have a lot of followers on jazz Twitter and, and there's so many people talking about, Oh, wow, well, that's, an, that's an amazing fit. And then I looked on on uh, some Grizzlies Twitter, and they're all talking about Donovan Klingon. I think Klingon had a more apparent, like, wow, he belongs moment than Castle because I already believed it, if that makes sense. Yeah, that, that Illinois game was, I mean, you, you saw the best of Castle and Klingon on the defensive end. If I'm not mistaken, I think Illinois was like 0 for 19 on shots contested by Klingon around the rim. And then, well, they went on a 30-0 run on offense. But Klingon hounded um, Shannon Jr., who, to me, outside of Edie, was the hottest player in the country coming into that game. I know he had like 102 points in the Big Ten tournament, and then he had some monster games in the in the NCAA tournament. He was averaging like just either like 31 a game over his last five or something like that. And, I mean, he struggled the entire game. Was he like two for 12 or something like that? Yeah, he he was schemed out of the game, and that was that was great coaching. But you had to have the personnel to take that good of an athlete, and that that's what impressed me more than even just the hounding of someone who's an inferior athlete, like yeah. uh, like he did against some of the guys on Alabama who are really good basketball players and actually pretty quick. But you just see the athleticism against Shannon. Where I, if he were a freshman coming out with the level he had, I'm not saying scoring, but just the, the kind of the explosiveness that he's always had, but he's kind of made it refined. I think he, everyone would say he's the best athlete in the draft, Shannon. So the fact that Castle won that matchup physically, I think is more impressive than what he did against Mark Sears, who's a fifth year, who is more guile and and change of pace than than athletic. Yeah. Yeah, Sears, Sears is pretty tricky to guard. I mean, he's got moves on top of moves and confident shooter. But, yeah, Castle has has definitely, in my opinion, put himself in position to be a top five pick. I know there's a lot of people that were really high on Zachary Reese's shape, but he's been really, really, really struggling since February. I mean, the numbers are are, are pretty alarming. And so I think there's a chance that Castle could pass him up in in the draft and so we'll we'll see how that goes but so you gave your prediction you said UConn by 20 here's a question for you put you on the hot seat Purdue wins what happened for Purdue to upset UConn okay I I think what would have to happen is Edie get clinging and foul trouble which I don't think is out of the realm of possibility and then I think when when and if that were to happen uh, they would ha- UConn would have to double team, and then Edie would have to make the right reads, trust his teammates, and you'd need Fletcher Lawyer and Mason Gillis in particular to hit a lot of threes. I don't think Hurley's going to double when Klingon's in the game, and I think it's going to be a nightmare for the other four players. And Edie might, like, I don't think he will score 40, but like if, to accentuate the point, I think he could score 40, and if they don't help off, UConn will just outscore them, and, and the rest of the team won't be able to score. So they would need double team from UConn, excellent shooting, and then they just need a bad shooting night from UConn. So that recipe seems unlikely. I'm rooting for P- P- Purdue. I've loved Matt Painter and his offensive schemes for years and years, the way he adapts to his personnel. But I think the most talented team in the country has the coach that's got the most buy-in in the country at the same time, and it's a dangerous proposition for every other team. And I'm an idiot because I, I decided not to bet on UConn on, uh, mm-hmm. on March Madness, even though in every single locked on college basketball poll this year, I had UConn number one, so I'm I'm just resenting my own stubbornness, but I'm pretty sure UConn's going to win, like convincingly. All right, last question. Let's say Edie gets totally neutralized by Klingon. I'm talking similar to what happened with Stefan Castle and Terrence Shannon. How does that impact both of their draft status, or does it? I think Klingon can move himself up a spot or two. I, I don't think the neutralizing Edie does as much as what he did against Alabama or Illinois for his stock where he's playing in space and blocking shots because that's more of what NBA evaluators are looking at. Uh, as for Edie, if he's not able to dominate against someone similar to his own size, I think that could drop him a little bit in the eyes of uh, of the beholders. But I, uh, 
I, I don't think Edie's done anything to change other than show he's been more conditioned to this year and he's gotten a little stronger, a little better touch than, than what he did last year. So what, I say all that to say, I don't think the tournament's really going to sway what you what you're picking Edie to do. Like Edie's going to do what Edie does, and if he has a bad game, then so be it. I don't think that changes his draft stock. It just means that Purdue won't win. All right, one more question: Can Donovan Klingen go number one? Yes, I, I I wouldn't, but I but I can envision a world in which it's possible if he dominates this game, and the team that's picking is set on a center and they don't think SAR is necessarily a center. They think he's a power forward and, and they're like, well, we might as well get a position of choice of our future as opposed to the player of choice. I, I think there's more upside in SAR than there is for Klingon, but, but there's a, there's a way I would say it's unlikely, but there's a way. Yeah. That, that could be very, it could be very interesting, especially if the rumors are that he's, he can knock down shots and make threes and like workouts and practice. So imagine a situation where he's knocking down corner threes or pick and pop threes or pick and pop jumpers in, in workouts. Then I, I mean, I can't see a world where he could end up going number one. Well, that wraps up this episode of the locked on NBA big board podcast. Be sure to tune in after the NCAA tournament game championship game. We're going to share our thoughts on the matchup. Leaf thinks that UConn wins by 20. I think that ED gets, I, I mean, I think UConn's going to win, but I definitely think that statistically ED is going to win the matchup. But I, I can't wait. This is a national championship game I'm looking forward to. I can't say some of the last ones I've been like really, really eager to see, but this is a, a very interesting one because, like I've said in, in this episode, you got the most dominant offensive force against the most dominant defensive player they play the same exact positions they have totally different draft ranges so i think this is going to be a really good championship game it's going to be lead to really good conversations as far as zach Eady and donovan Klingon over the next few days but once again it's rafael barlow with leaf tulane and we are out of here